Good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever and whenever you are listening to this uh, to this Facebook cast. And welcome to the Four Keys of Kabbalah. This is a book that will be coming out shortly. It uh, explains what life is about, our purpose, our personal purpose, why we have what the challenges are about, how we navigate these challenges, and how we can really see them as as not as opportunities and blessings, and to become the uh, to to fulfill the purpose for which we were created, and um, many uh, insights into how to deal with how to deal with so many of the difficult things that we deal with in life, uh, starting with waking up in the morning and everything through the day, dealing with difficult people, sometimes our own self. So since this is a book on Kabbalah, I figured it would be most appropriate to start off with a miracle. So who's in the mood for a miracle? Uh, you want me to cure the virus? All right. That's, uh, that's not going to happen so fast, but uh, not through me at least. Yeah, God can in one moment, but Another miracle. So here we go. Here is a miracle. I have in front of me a cup of coffee. You'll have to take my word for it. It's uh, made from fresh coffee beans, ground, pour over coffee, and uh, mm, smells, smells like coffee. And uh, can't wait to drink this coffee. However, first, as I said, a miracle. So here we go. Here's the miracle. I'm now going to transform this physical beverage into a manifestation of godliness in this world. Are you ready? Baruch ata Adinoi Eloheinu Melech HaElam Shehakol Nihiyah Bidbarai Hmm, there. Did you see it? If you missed it, you can go back to the recording and watch it again. That was the miracle. So <clears throat> this is a four-part series. We're going to start off talking about Kabbalah key number one. Kabbalah key number one basically is about all of existence. That all of existence, everything that God brought about, was brought about through a divine energy. That divine energy became manifest through the divine word. When we open up the Torah, the Bible, we read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we go on to read the story of creation. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God separated between the waters, and there was the waters above, the waters below. God created all of existence. So when we read the story, it's uh, well, somewhat simplistic. And I actually suggest to people who want to find out more about Judaism and more about God, maybe you don't want to start off with the Bible. Because really, to understand the Torah, you need a broader perspective to really understand what it's talking about. The Kabbalah gives us an amazing perspective of this story of creation. What it explains is that these words are actually a divine code. They are the way that the divine energy is becoming manifest in this world, not in the world, but becoming manifest to bring about the physical universe, to bring about all of existence. So when we're reading the story, very interestingly, it is a story. It's telling us what happened, but that story is also a code. That is the code of existence. So anything and everything that exists has within it the divine spark, the word of God that brings it about, that brings it into existence. So, we can think about it 
In our day and age, we could think about a computer code. We all know that we, of course, right, we're all watching a computer now. You're watching a, uh, an image of me speaking on a screen, but it's not really me. It's, it's an image, and that image is brought about through a computer program. And that computer program is comprised of digits, of characters, and those digits and characters, if we open it up, if you're not a computer program, it just looks like nonsense to us. But what that program is doing is it's actually informing the computer how to function. The ultimate computer program is the binary code, which is a system of zeros and ones. And that is the underlying uh, program of the computer, which is telling the computer energy on or energy off. Energy on is one, energy off is zero. Perhaps you've seen on appliances, you've seen the on off switch, which looks something like this, like an O with an I inside of it. And I struggled for quite a while to understand why an O and an I, I is ignite, O is what, I do, off, I couldn't figure it out until I realized, oh, it's the binary code. The zero is off, the on-off switch is off, and the one is on. Thus, we have in our daily life a reminder of this binary code. But the binary code is just informing. The code is there in order to inform the computer how the electricity should flow through the semiconductor. The semiconductor is the silicon in the computer. And how should the electricity flow? Basically, there are an infinite amount of combinations, all determined through the binary code. Energy on, energy off. So with this as, a, uh, as an analogy, as a backdrop, we can certainly understand, in a, I think, in a, much greater, in a much greater way, when we're talking about God bringing about all of existence from nothing into something, right? That's called ex nihilo, out of nothing. God brings everything about. So that is the divine energy becoming manifest in the world through the divine word. There's actually a, uh, was a physicist out of Princeton, John Wheeler, who had a theory uh, based on his uh, research and his lifelong study of, of uh, quantum physics. And his theory was called it by bit, meaning that any it that exists has to have a byte of information behind it. And that byte of information has to inform what it is and how it fits into the entire scheme of things, it by bit. And he uh, hypothesized that if we've learned anything with all of our advancements about technology and information, we have to understand that behind everything is not energy. Energy, matter for sure, and even energy are, uh, are, are so to speak, peripherals but what's behind everything is information. Well, if we open up the Kabbalistic works, we see this is exactly how creation is described. It is divine information becoming manifest in the world. Through That's what we mean by the word, the word of Hashem. Bidvar Hashem Shemaim Nasu. With the word of God, the heavens were created. And that divine code continues at every moment, continuously in everything that exists. So, for instance, this cup of coffee. We see, well, you just see the, the cup there. There's coffee in there. All right? Can you see that? No, it's all right. You'll take my word for it. I'm honest most of the time. So, a cup of coffee. We just see a physical substance. But really, behind the cup, there's the word of God. In the coffee, there's the word of God. And Judaism actually gives us a way to bring out 
the godliness, to reveal the godliness that is inside of this coffee through the blessing. That was the blessing that I said at the beginning. So, there we have it. So everything in life, not just the coffee, although I, it's my own theory that coffee has an extra measure of divine presence, but that's just a theory. Us, the human being, we are the mother load of this divine energy that becomes manifest in the soul. So the, the human soul, the uh, neshama, that is, so to speak, the word of God that is inside of us that brings us into being, that brings us to life. Every single moment that, that divine reality is within us. And not just within us. It's within the other person that we see. We see somebody else, our spouse, our children, our loved ones, the male person, right? The person uh, making deliveries, the, the person that we don't like. When we come to realize and understand that there is a part of God within that person, the neshama, the soul, we see that person in a whole new light. When we realize that our food is actually being brought about through a divine reality, we see that food in a different light. Everything in life becomes transformed through seeing the world in this way. We'll use another analogy. Imagine a painting, a beautiful painting. You have one in mind? Go ahead and post it. Uh, post it in the comments here if you want to post your favorite painting or the first one that comes to mind. So many beautiful uh, masterpieces created by, by artists that were able to just convey such beauty with a stroke of a brush. So, I am sure that some of you, there's a 45 second lag here, so I haven't seen what you posted yet, but I'm sure that some of you posted Starry Night, one of my favorites. It's Van Gogh. And uh, I guess if you're familiar with it, then you know it's a Van Gogh. So Starry Night, it's in the, the MoMA in uh, Manhattan. And when you look at this painting, you realize that this creation here is basically the manifestation of the creativity of the artist. It is the information, right? Creativity is information of, of how things should be and how they should look, how they should present themselves. And so in Van Gogh's mind, this was, this was his idea. And he was able to execute his idea and bring it about with such clarity, with such lucidity, with such vibrance. And we look at it, we, we can enjoy it. We can say, this is, this is a masterpiece. This is a, this is a beautiful piece of art. So what really creates this piece of art and what is manifest in every brushstroke of the artist is the artist's, Van Gogh's, creativity. So uh, the color, the shade, where everything should be, right? Take a look at that, right? That is, that is a manifestation of Van Gogh's creativity right there. Now, what happens... If you would have a, uh, a machine that could suck out creativity. We all know someone like that, right? <laughs> you, you're thinking all creative and you run into this one person and then all of a sudden, oh, they've just sucked out all of your creativity. All right. Anyway, so imagine there's such a machine that can suck out the creativity of the artist. If you'd suck out Van Gogh's creativity from the, from the Starry Night, what would you... What would you end up with? What would you have? Of course, you would have the paint 
and you'd have the empty canvas. It would go back, when you remove the creativity of the artist, it goes back to what preceded it. goes back to what it was before. And so existence, this entire universe, that's a pretty big existence. We can't even fathom the size of uh, our state unless you live in Rhode Island. Uh, and the, the globe, planet Earth, our solar system, the, the galaxy, the universe, right? So the universe was brought about through the divine creativity. What preceded it was what we call, we call nothingness, because there was nothing apparent to us. It was just God. Right? When we say something from nothing, we don't really mean that it's from nothing, because everything is being created from a divine energy. But it's nothing apparent, nothing that we can sense. And so the divine energy brings existence into being through the divine word. And that happens at every single moment. The Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, based on a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov, that La Olam Hashem Devarcha Nitzav Bashamayim, forever, O oh God, your word is standing in heaven. Those were the words that God used to bring about heaven. Those words continue in heaven to bring it about at every moment, to bring it about from the nothingness that preceded it into the somethingness that we call the heavens. Of course, when an artist creates something, all they need to do is to, really all they're doing is shifting something from one place to another. So I move my coffee from this place to that place. And if you are a... Um, a modern artist, I could put this on top of a ladder and call it a piece of art. So you're basically taking things and moving it around. You, uh, you can take, uh, you take paint, right? And you move it around on the canvas and you create the artistic productions. So since they're only moving something from one place to another, all they have to do is shift the place and they can leave the piece of art alone. Although their creativity remains embedded in the piece of art, but they can sell the piece, they can go and work on another piece. They are now uh, separated from what the, that which they have created. When God created the world, however, he wasn't taking something that existed and changing it into something else, right? The joke they tell about the, uh, the scientists that had become uh, so advanced and with technology and in biology, they finally decided that they could, uh, they could create on their own without God. And so they challenged God to a um, creation off, right? We're going, to, we're going to create something. And so they summoned God to this, to this test, to this contest. And they say, okay, well, we're going to start with a lump of dirt. And God says to them, oh, no. Go, get, go create your own dirt, right? So in the human mind, we can only create something from something that already exists, right? But for God, it is creating something out of so-called nothing. And that takes a constant flow of energy from the divine to bring about existence. And so this is quite the piece of art. In fact, stated in the Talmud, uh, based on a verse in Samuel, says, Ein sur kelo kenu, that there is no rock like our God. The Talmud comments, change the word sur to tsayar, a painter, basically an artist. Ein tsayar kelo kenu, there's no artist like our God. So God is the ultimate artist and all that exists has within it this divine reality, right? This divine truth, this divine word. And so, as I mentioned, this is the uh, first of a uh, four-part series of talking about the four keys of Kabbalah. You can go to the link in the, in the heading to see a little bit more about the book. But key number one is that everything that exists 
has a divine spark within it that brings it about, that brings it into existence. That is Kabbalah key number one. Now, imagine waking up in the morning and realizing that you are a manifestation of the divine, that you have your soul inside of you that is part of God. You see another person and you realize they are a manifestation of God. You see the world, the the air that you breathe, the food that you eat, the the mountains, the trees, everything, all of existence. You look into the skies, you see the stars, and you realize everything in the world is all a manifestation of God. Huh. Wow. So why can't we see it? It would be so lovely, and I'm looking here on the, uh, on the starry night to see... Well, we see the watermark because this is just a, a printout from a website. So there's a watermark on there, as you can see. Uh, but when we look at the world, we don't see a watermark. We don't see a signature. It would be nice if we looked at the world and godliness would be apparent. Could you imagine that every moment of every day you would be aware of the divine? Huh. That would be such a world to live in. You would be such a human being. The world would be a glorious existence and you would realize it every moment. You would never argue. You would never feel upset. You would never feel angry. You'd always be motivated to play your part in, in God's plan in the world. So imagine such a world where everything, the divine, was apparent. I mean, if you create something, if you create the most magnificent masterpiece, you would you'd put your signature on it. You would not want to remain anonymous. Wouldn't that be the best world, a world where God did not remain anonymous? Huh. Well, you'll have to stay tuned to uh, the next class, which will be Kabbalah Key number two which will answer this question and explain to us, and hopefully we will come to understand that there's something much more profound. There's something much more amazing than a world where we perceive godliness readily. There's something much more amazing than a world where we would be, re we would be aware of godliness within ourselves at every single moment. There's something much better than that. So stay tuned to our uh, lesson. It's going to be this coming Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time uh, on this channel. And we will continue with uh, Kabbalah key number two of the four keys of Kabbalah. Uh, if you have any questions here in the notes, hopefully we got some uh do we get any paintings here in the comments? Uh, somebody asked me about the Quran. No, never read it. Sorry. Wrong. You probably got mixed up. Wrong website. Okay. All right. Oh, look at that. Okay. Well, in any case, I don't see any questions here. Hopefully everybody enjoyed and we will continue next time with Kabbalah key number two. Have a wonderful day.